Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Patarani Nivasesis and Nivadi Paspatyati Satarani Vande Ham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Guru and Vaishnavam Chacha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Bitam Stam Sajivam Sadvoitam Sadvadutam Padijana Sahita Krishna Jaitanya Deva Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Bitam Chacha Vanta Kapa Jubasta Kipas Nivya Bata Padijanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavavya Namo Namo Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So it's September 4th, 2021 from the Bhakti Center in New York over the internet. We're reading a difficult verse today, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 9, Chapter 14, King Purva, Enchanted by Urvasi, Text 37. Shriyo yakar, Shriyo yakar, not kuryur, Durmarsha priya sahasa, Gnatya parte pivishrabam, Patim vartaram apyuta. Striyaha, women, he, indeed. Akarunaha, merciless. Puraha, cunning. Durmarshaha, intolerant. Priha sahasaha, for their own pleasure they can do anything. Gnanti, they kill. Alpa arte, for a slight reason. Api, indeed. Vishrabdam, faithful. Patim, husband. Bhartaram, brother. Api, also. Uta, it is said. Srila Prabhupada translation. Women as a class are merciless and cunning. They cannot tolerate even a slight offense. For their own pleasure, they can do anything irreligious, and therefore, they do not fear killing even a faithful husband or brother. Chila Prabhupada's purport. And I'd like us to really concentrate here on uh, the beginning of this purport. King Pururava was greatly attached to Urvashi. So this gives us some context. Yet despite his faithfulness to her, she had left him. This also gives us some important context. Now, considering that the king was wasting his rarely achieved human form of life, another important context, Urvasi frankly explained the nature of a woman. Because of her nature, a woman can respond to even a slight offense from her husband by not only leaving him, but even killing him if required. If required is quite a funny way to say it. To say nothing of her husband, she can even kill her brother. That is a woman's nature. Therefore, in the material world, unless women are trained to be chaste and faithful to, your, to their husbands, there cannot be peace or prosperity in society. Striyo ya karuna kura dur marsha priyasa hasaha gnat ya parte pivishrabam pati brataram aputa. Women as a class are merciless and cunning. They cannot tolerate even a slight offense. For their own pleasure, they can do anything irreligious, and therefore they do not fear killing even a faithful husband or brother. All right, let's look here at how we understand statements from Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. So here we're looking at a difficult statement from the Shastra, and we're also looking at uh, some difficult things in purport. So as you may know, I'm the at the present time, I am the chairperson of the Shastric Advisory Council to ISKCON's Governing Body Commission. And uh, the Governing Body Commission commissioned us to put together a system of ISKCON hermeneutics, which means how do we understand the statements of Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra? So this is a sample hermeneutical path. There are other hermeneutical paths. 
And when we try to understand a statement from Shastra, difficult statements, not difficult statements, any statements from Shastra, uh, first we look at ourselves. We say, do I have good sadhana? Okay, well, I do my sadhana regularly. Is it good? Could be better. I could have more focus. I could have more love, right? So that, that may impact my realization. Am I aiming toward a mood of surrender and service to Srila Prabhupada and my spiritual master? So am I, am I trying to read this with a mood of, of surrender and service? Well, okay, I think I'm doing that. Do I have sufficient concrete experience of the topic in my personal life? Huh. Well, I have a lot of experience of people taking, uh, getting very upset at slight offense. I have a lot of experience of a person leaving someone who was faithful to them. I don't have any personal experience of murder. Do I have sufficient personal realization of the topic from my experience? I, I definitely have a lot of realization of the nature of people in this material world. Am I working towards embracing the principle of unity and diversity, that there can be many understandings? Yes. Do I have sufficient shraddha to accept that the motive behind the statement is pure and benevolent? Yes, yes, I do. I. I have faith that Urvasi's purpose in speaking this is pure and benevolent, and I have faith that Srila Prabhupada's purpose in speaking his purport is pure and benevolent. Do I have the humility to adequately acknowledge that I might not understand correctly or that my understanding is limited? Yes. Do I strive to be free of offense, especially towards other Vaishnavas? Yes. Am I doing my best to be a moral person with integrity? Do I live or strive to live primarily in the mode of goodness? I, I try. Can't say I always do, but I try. Is my present state of mind conducive to understanding the statement? Yeah, yeah, it is. Right, I'm not upset about anything. It's early in the morning. How far am I ready for personal transformation? Wow, that, that's a really interesting question. How far am I ready for personal trans, transformation? Hmm. Am, am I willing to have my own views changed? Am I willing to have my own heart changed? Right? I mean, shoo. I don't know. That, that's a big one, isn't it? Okay. Am I willing to apply what I'm studying? Whoa, that's also a big one. Which personal and cultural biases am I aware of? Well, I have some personal biases, being a woman myself. I have a lot of cultural biases right now in the world with views about women. Um, these documents are publicly available. We can make everybody. And we have a course that we teach on this. We have a, um, an eight-part course if the Bhakti Center wants to sponsor a course. Am I aware of my motives? Is my goal to find the truth or to prove that I am right. Whoa. Huh. Do I really want to understand this? Or am I trying going to just try to make a point here? That's another big one. All right. Do I already have an opinion on the topic? Oh, yes, I definitely do. If so, am I prepared to change it? Yeah, I think I am. Do I have the spiritual adhikar qualification to be studying the statement? Yes, for sure. Have I read all the major works of Srila Prabhupada? Yes, many times. How well do I know the language? It's my native language. Am I comfortable with uncertainty or paradox if needed? Yes. Am I willing to pray and wait for understanding to emerge? I did a lot of that the last couple of days for this verse. All right, now in relation to Siddhanta, what we're trying to, and this is a very important thing. So we want to see if this verse is a statement of something that is universally true. So is this verse a statement of something that is true for all people, all times, all places, and all circumstances? So for that, we're going to look at what do we mean by Siddhanta? Okay. So let's look at another document here. What we mean by Siddhanta, what we mean by something that is always true at all times and all places and for all people. We have 10 tenets of Gaudiya Siddhanta. Uh, this we extracted from Srila Prabhupada's commentary on, das, on um, the Chatur Sloki of the Bhagavatam as given in the Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila. So these are our statements that are true always, 
for all people at all times and all places and all circumstances. Lord Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He has his external inferior or material energy, Maya. He also has his internal superior or spiritual energy. He has his parts and parcels, the living entities who are spiritual by nature. The living entities in the material world are conditioned by the external energy. The living entities in the spiritual world are liberated. A chinta beta beta tattva, simultaneous oneness and difference of the Lord and his energies. Love of God is the highest goal of life. To achieve love of God, one should practice devotional service. This knowledge can be received by us through the specific succession. Okay, let's go back to today's verse. And women as a class are merciless and cunning. They cannot tolerate a slight offense. They can do anything irreligious. They don't mind killing anybody. Um, all right, I don't see anything there that is is here. So this is not, this verse is not a restatement of eternal universal transcontextual truth. It's just not. Okay, we, it's not a statement of that. All right, well, let's look at again. Okay, we're going back to a hermeneutical path. So is it a restatement or elucidation of Sananta? No, it's not. Is it an application of Siddhanta? Is it taking an eternal truth and applying it to a particular context? Well, let's go back and look at our statements. We could say the living entities in the material world are conditioned by the external energy. Um, is it an application of that? A little bit, a little bit. Okay, another possibility is that it is supporting Siddhanta. It's a statement that will help people. And such could be certainly said of Srila Prabhupada's statements at the end of the purport about women should be chaste, faithful wives. That's not Siddhanta. It's not an application of Siddhanta. It's something that's supporting Siddhanta. Another possibility is that a statement is opposed to Siddhanta. Uh, however, that's definitely not the case. All right. So now that we know that, we know that the statements we're looking at are not restatements of eternal transcontextual universal truths. They're to some extent an application of those universal truths, and they're mostly simply supporting it. So now to try to understand it, we're going to be, I'm just going to be going through these questions quickly, and then I'm going to be applying them to this statement. So we're, we're, we would focus on the meaning of the specific verse purport. What is being said here? What does it mean? How is it relevant to me in terms of achieving final and intermediate goals of devotion service? Then the context, which in this case is super important, and Srila Prabhupada brings out the context in the first two and a half sentences of his purport. Focus on the context of the verse purport or statement. Ask him, how does this statement fit into the rest of the chapter of the book? To whom was it spoken? In response to what question or problem? When and where was the statement made? What other statements does the Shastra or Shiva Prabhupada make on this topic? How does this Shastra instruct me to understand itself and its statements? Well, that we have, how does the Bhagavatam teach us to understand the Bhagavatam? Then what is the place of this chapter book or conversation in the hierarchy of Shastra and the works of Srila Prabhupada and the Acharyas? Now, it's also important, although I wasn't going to look at that specifically in this class, how it's in the ninth canto, preparing us to enter into the tenth canto. Is this statement or the whole section or work of which in a part on a beginning, intermediate, or advanced level? So the Bhagavatam in general is on an intermediate level. Uh, this particular statement, I'd say, is on the beginner level. Examine how the particular Shastra is structured. For example, is this focused on bhakti? Well, everything in the Bhagavatam is focused on bhakti, ultimately. But this is really leading us to detachment. Genre and mood of the work as a whole, is it philosophical or is it primarily poetry or narrative? Well, of course, the Bhagavatam weaves together philosophy and narrative. This particular verse we're reading is very much a narrative. Now, who is it for? What are the qualifications of the intended audience? So this statement is for Pururava, 
a highly elevated, sophisticated Vedic king. Uh, what is it about? It's about becoming detached from the material world and taking up Krishna consciousness. What is it for? What's its fruit? The fruit is for giving up material attachments that are only causing us pain. How does it go about teaching what it's teaching? Uh, through disgust, through revulsion. Are there ambiguities in the language such as changes in the use of language over time? Um, in this case, I would say no. The historical context where applicable, um, I would say no. Through the statement repeatedly deepening your understanding each time, resist taking a statement out of context or is isolated from the entire work. Study Shastra and the instructions of Srila Prabhupada holistically and thoroughly. Consult with the understanding of other acharyas and contemporary Vaishnavas. And then a very important thing, research Srila Prabhupada's application of the topic under discussion. So how did Srila Prabhupada actually treat people? How did Srila Prabhupada actually treat in this uh, case, or we would say women? Okay, so that's our hermeneutical path. And based on that hermeneutical path, now we are going to be looking at this verse and purport today. All right. Second here. Okay. Yes. So what is Urvasi's main point here? He's talking about that only Krishna is going to be faithful. That's it. That, that's the point. Why are you trusting another jiva, she said. It's not going to work out. She said, I don't know why you want me back. I already left you. You were faithful to me and I left you. Why are you asking me to come back here for you? You should go to Krishna. Hmm? Uh, that's the main uh, thrust of this verse. That no matter how faithful we are, people will disappoint us or will disappoint them. Uh, we might think there's an exception. We might think, well, I'm going to find some jiva who's not like that. She's saying, yeah, it's not like that, right? Now, a social solution to this, a, a somewhat partial social solution, is to train people in good qualities and stability, which Shri Prabhupada talks about at the end of the purport. But the only real solution is to have our investment in Krishna. Okay, so regardless of our faithfulness, we have this faithfulness, mm -hmm. faithful. Faithful, Vishrabdham, a faithful husband, a faithful brother. Now, all of us have experience that we love somebody, we're loyal to them, we would do anything for them, and something happens. They disappoint us, maybe they betray us, maybe they leave us, they die. Maybe they're just not available to us. I often give an example. It's, it's a very minor example, but still it's an example that I had a friend who said, Ormila, I will always be there for you. Whenever you need me, you call me. I'm always there for you. So one day I called her. I said, I have a doctor's appointment and my car just broke down. Can you, are you willing to drive me to the doctor or lend me your car? And she said, no, it's my day off. I don't want to, I don't want to bother. And I thought, wow, okay, I guess she's not really there for me. I mean, it was a minor thing, but this sort of thing happens. And maybe we've been blessed in our life that uh, we haven't had this experience ourselves, but we certainly know, we all know somebody who's divorced. You know, when they went into the marriage, they went into the marriage thinking, I'm going to love this person forever and they're going to love me forever. And we all know of a divorce where one partner was faithful and the other one left. Every, we all know such a story, right? I'm sure we all know such a story in our personal circle of people that we know. And if not, then we certainly know some in the headlines, in the news, where one partner was faithful and the other one wasn't. Maybe they were unfaithful sexually. Maybe they were unfaithful financially. 
or maybe who knows, <laughs> or they just left. Maybe one partner was faithful, one partner was abusive. Shiva Prabhupada uh, gives the example many times of Gandhi, that Gandhi served his country, he said, and nobody can say that Gandhi didn't serve his country faithfully. He said, but even though Gandhi served his country so faithfully, one of his countrymen was dissatisfied. At least one Indian citizen said, I am he's so dissatisfied that he killed him, that he killed Gandhi. It is not possible for us to fully satisfy the people that we serve. Peru Riva had served Urvasi so nicely and she left. She engineered the leaving. She said, you know, you have to take care of my lambs and I don't want to see you naked unless we're having sex. I think, did she also give the requirement about food? But she wanted to go back to the heavenly planets. You know, she was sent to the earth and she had a mission on earth, but she didn't want to stay on earth. <laughs> she wanted to go back to heaven. I mean, who wants to stay on earth if you can go to heaven? So she left. The Gantarvis came and took her lambs and Peruva runs to get the lambs and he runs out naked and the Gantarvis shine a light on him. There he is running around naked and he loses her lambs. And so she leaves. And Urvasi has so many lovers. These Apsaras in the heavenly planets, they have so many lovers. It's not sinful for them to do that. But you know, she liked Perura. It's not that she didn't like him, but she had her own life she wanted to lead. <laughs> she wasn't just going to hang out with him and be an earthly queen. And this is the way it is. You know, we're, we're going to pour our heart into another jiva. We're going to pour our heart into a company that we work for, a group of jivas, a country, and over and over and over and over and over and over and over, we will get disappointed. And my dear friends, we are also disappointing others. There are times when I'm convinced that people have betrayed me, that I have given everything in good faith and people have betrayed me and they see everything exactly the opposite. They see they've given everything to me in good faith and I've betrayed them. There are people who think I wasn't there for them when they needed it. I may not like to think of myself that way. I may think I'm very loyal and dependable. But not everybody agrees. I know that for a fact. There are people who feel that I've offended them. That I haven't treated them nicely. It just happened to me in Janmastami. Some uh, devotee member of the congregation brought, uh, was, bought some prats for Tulsi. We needed to transplant Tulsi right away. He wasn't even going to come for Janmastami. He was going to send them for someone else. He came for Janmastami and he forgot to bring them. And I gave him a little bit of a hard time about it. And he was really hurt. And he said, wow, Urmila, I thought you were an advanced devotee. And, and you really hurt my feelings. It hurt his whole faith. We ended up chatting over. He went home and I ended up spending like from... 10 to 11.30 on John Mastami, chatting with him over the internet and apologizing. So I hurt people. People hurt me, I hurt them, I disappoint them. Ultimately, we're gonna die. Oh, even if somebody never disappoints me, never offends me, never betrays me, never leaves, they're gonna leave me when they die. My parents have passed away, they're gone. What can they do for me now? Nothing. Or I'm going to die. So we might think, well, there'll be an exception. There's going to be an exception to this. This person. And particularly, people have a tendency to think that women are an exception. There's going to be a tendency to think, well, women are very saintly. 
I mean, there's that tendency because it's a fact that the vast majority of violent crimes are committed by men. Far more violent criminals, murderers, cheaters, thieves are male than female. It is not even a comparison. It's so great. You know, people are much more shocked when a woman kills her husband than when a man kills his wife or children. If a man kills his children, they're not as shocked as if a woman kills. If a woman kills her children, they assume she's mentally ill. She can't be a normal woman. So here, Irvis is saying, uh, women may not do it as much as men, but they do it too. The women are also selfish. See, I think it's possible to read this verse and say, this verse is saying women as compared to men can be selfish criminals. But that reading of this verse makes absolutely no sense. Neither in Irvasi's time, nor in Srila Prabhupada's time, nor in our time, have women ever been more criminal as compared to men. That has never been the case. So this statement is not a statement of women are worse than men. You know, Prabhupada is saying women as a class is how he's translating this. And it, first of all, of course, it's not that all women are murderers, for many sakes. Statistically, that's not fact. But the point is that women, conditioned souls who are women are not any more saintly than conditioned souls who are men. I mean, if we look at the statistics, and Tulsi Rani was very, I asked her to get the statistics for me. If we look at the statistics, so uh, analyzing over 11 years in 18 states in the United States, 55% of murders were between intimate romantic partners. And I think such a statistic is pretty much uh, universal in this, on this earth, that over half of murders generally are between intimate partners. I mean, unless you're in a part of the world where there's, you know, some rampant civil war and stuff going on lots of gang-related violence, you know, a very violent, murder-prone place. But in general, over half of murders are between intimate partners hmm. or involve some intimate partnership, and 93% of them are between the partners themselves. So the other 7%, it might be some other relative, like here, Irvis, he's talking about brother. So it had to do with an intimate partnership, but the murder might have been done by a brother or a sister or a parent. Okay, so other parts of the statistics is about a third of the time the couple had argued right before the murder took place. About 12% were associated with jealousy. I, I would have thought it would have been higher. The majority of the victims were under the age of 40. 15% were pregnant. So in 15% of cases, a man killed a preg his pregnant partner. 54% were from guns. All right, now, interestingly, 68% of those killed were women and 32% of those killed were men. Now, of course, there are some homosexual partnerships and I don't have the statistics as to the 68% who were killed were women, were those all killed by men? But I think we can assume since uh, same-sex partnerships are less than 10% of the population, that the vast majority of the 68% of the domestic homicides, intimate romantic partner homicides are done by men. So we have nearly 70% of the intimate partner homicides are done by men and uh, approximately 30% of the intimate romantic partner homicides are done by women. So therefore taking that into consideration, there is no way that this verse is saying men are nice and women are not. This is just not what it's saying, it can't be, impossible. What the verse is saying is women can be nasty too. You might expect that a, that a man is gonna be like that. Yeah, I'm thinking when I was little, my mother used to sing this song about, you know, don't trust men. I mean, men are notorious for wanting to have more than one woman in their life. 
uh, generally plural marriage in the world is a man having many women, not a woman having many men. That's just the fact. The societies in which women have more than one husband is a general thing are much less. The instances in the Shastra of such things are much less. We have Dropadi, we have Marisha, we have the wife of the fire god, the 49 fire gods. But so many instances of men who have many women. So a man being unfaithful to the wife is much more common than the woman being unfaithful to the husband. And maybe, maybe in 2021, this is all crazy. And the instances of men murdering their wife are far greater, over double, over double that of women murdering their husband. So Irvasi's point here is women can do it too. You trusted me, you thought, oh, not only she's a woman, she's a demigoddess. Wow. Demigoddesses are, I mean, she's an upsara, but still, they're a much higher class than humans. And she's saying, but I, I didn't, I wasn't faithful. She said, you trusted me. And she's beautiful. We tend to trust people who are beautiful. Statistically speaking, beautiful people are generally trusted more than not beautiful. Tall people are trusted more, by the way, also. So here I am, I'm this beautiful demigoddess, and I broke your heart. She said, don't, don't trust someone just because they're a woman. I'm going to trust them. I mean, we see this with um, sexual abuse, right? Again, sexual abusers are predominantly male, overwhelmingly male. But there are female sexual abusers. I mean, I, I thought it's often funny, you know, the idea of, well, if you have a woman taking care of children, there's no way she's going to be abusive. That's possible. And it's sad, you know, so there, I, a lot of men have said to me how, how awful it is that just because they're a man, it's assumed that they're going to be violent or it's assumed that they're going to be abusive. You know, and I know men who are victims of domestic violence from their wives, and they say nobody will pay them any attention because the assumption is always that men are the rapists, men are the abusers, men are the killers, because statistically, that's true. But that doesn't mean we're going to assume that every man is abusive and every man is a pedophile and every man is a rapist. And sometimes women do these things so that's the point. So Srila Prabhupada is talking about two solutions here in the purport. At the end of the purport, he talks about the solution of having stable families, teaching women to be chaste and faithful to their husbands. Of course, other places he's going to talk about having men take care of their wives. Uh, he's not talking about that in this purport because Puruva did take nice care of his wife. In fact, that was mentioned by Urvasi. He was a good husband. He was faithful. He was a good, caring husband. The fault was all hers. It wasn't his at all. So therefore, in this particular case, Srila Prabhupada's not talking about the duty of the man, the duty of the husband. But in well, many places, he said, women should be trained to be chaste and faithful, and men should be trained to be first-class devotees of the Lord, first-class human beings. He says, not that the woman should be chaste and faithful while the man is, is a low-class person. So this is a material solution. Train human beings to be ladies and gentlemen. Have stability in society. And people get married very young, soon after puberty, both men and women. There are extended families. There's smaller villages where people know each other and it's a lot harder to do something sinful. You know, have a society. Thank you so much. Have a society where people are trained to be faithful, where people, where women are trained to be chaste and faithful, where men are trained to be responsible, where there's stability in society. If we do that, are we going to cut down on, you know, adultery? Are we going to cut down on intimate partner murders? Yes, certainly. But is that the whole solution? No, of course not. And therefore, in the beginning of the purport, Srila Prabhupada talks about uh, 
Considering that the king was wasting his rarely achieved human form of life, Irvesey frankly explained the nature of a woman. So why is she saying this to him? Why is she saying, hey, wake up. Why do you want me again? This life as a human being is valuable. Why, why are you going after me again? I was already unfaithful to you. I already left you. I've already, you've already seen that I'm a cheater. I can even kill you. Why are you running after me? This reminds us, of course, of Abilva Mangala Thakur, who had achieved the state of bhava in a previous life. And then in his next life, he was born in a Brahmin family and he became very attached to his girlfriend, Chintamani, such that he left his father's funeral early in a storm. He crossed the river by holding onto a corpse that he thought was a log. He went up to Chintamani's room holding onto a snake that he thought was a vine because she had locked the door, because she thought it's a storm, he's not going to come. And she said, why are you so attracted to me just because I'm a young, pretty woman? Why aren't you so attracted to Krishna? So this is what Urvasi is saying. Because this is the whole message of the Bhagavatam. That's how we know that. The whole message of the Bhagavatam is be attached to Krishna. We're about to come into the 10th canto. So why are we going to be interested in Krishna? If we're still looking at the jivas of this world, that they're our shelter. Just having a stable society is not enough. I mean, look at India, where in most cases, people are still married young and there, there isn't a high divorce rate, especially in the villages. How many men are killing their wives over the, how much dowry they have? It's a big problem. Men beating their wives, men killing their wives. Even though we have a, it's a fairly stable society with moral principles. So it's not enough. It's not enough. I mean, right now in 2021, society is highly unstable in regard to moral sexual behavior. We have a, a very, very unstable society in terms of that. And a tremendous domestic violence and abuse. And sexual violence, murder. But if we go back to an earlier time when society was much more stable and pretty much everybody was married young and there was practically speaking no divorce, it's not that there weren't any intimate partner homicides or beatings or unfaithfulness. That alone, material solutions alone will not solve. The only thing that's going to really solve this problem is if we take our heart and we give it to Krishna. And then we do our duties in this world as a service to Krishna, not because we think that our duties in this world are always going to make us happy. If we think, you know, well, if I'm really a good person, then I, I won't be cheated. Forget it. Or if I find really good people to trust, I won't be treated. I won't be cheated. Forget it. No matter how good I am, I'm going to be cheated. No matter how good are the people that I trust, I'm going to be cheated. Let me fall in love with Krishna. And we should ask ourselves every day, did I do something today? Even if just for a moment. Did I do something today, even if just for a moment, where I really felt that connection with Krishna? Where I really felt that love with Krishna? Where my heart was moved? for Krishna. Every day, at least something, not just to get my rounds done. Something. When I'm taking prasadam, when I'm dealing with another person, have I worked to get connected with Krishna? And when people in this world disappoint me because they will, for sure, even if they're demigods. And when I disappoint others, because I will, for sure, because I'm a Kali Yuga human. To not be shocked. 
I can't believe it. I can't believe that person disappointed me. That's the way the person reacted to me on John Mastery. Or, you know, I can't believe that you were upset about the pots. How could you be upset? You're a devotee. It's like, well, sorry, I'm Kali Yuga Hindu. To not be surprised and to put our heart to Krishna, to be compassionate to others when they disappoint us because they will, to be compassionate with ourselves when we disappoint others because we will, and to give our heart to Krishna. Krishna will never disappoint us. He will never cheat us. He will always be faithful, always. He will take the smallest amount of service and magnify it. One tall sea leaf, one tall sea leaf in water, and he sells himself to his devotee forever. So questions, comments, additions, subtractions, chastisements. Hi, Krishna, or Mila. Hi, Krishna. I know I already asked, but I just wanted to state again how amazing those documents that you briefly showed us on the screen were. And I, I would love for the Bhakti Center, if they are listening, if they could uh, team up with you to offer that class, because I, I feel like the way you broke down this, um, this verse and this topic, which normally I would have felt very triggered by and would have had such a hard time kind of analyzing and just would have been so stuck in the emotions of it that you really with these documents and these the, the way I mean you always are very good at kind of breaking down things logically but just like seeing a little bit of the thought process behind mm -hmm. it all just I was able to just be with it and just look at it in a very calm way and just understand like where like I was coming at it with baggage and where it was actually coming in. And, and especially that um, when you showed that screenshot of the Siddhanta, I believe, and like mm -hmm. just having that as, like I, I wanna like almost print it and laminate it and just <laughs> have it with me so that when I'm feeling upset about something, just being like, okay, it is it referenced? Like, what is this, you know? Mm -hmm. I just, I'm yeah, not so that's very kind of clear in my communication, but thank you. Yeah, that's the heart of the hermeneutic process is that comparing any statement we're trying to understand to universal, eternal, transcontextual truth. And seeing, is this statement a restatement of a universal, eternal, transcontextual truth? That it's true for all living beings in all places at all times. Is it a restatement of that? Is it an application of that? Is it supporting that or is it opposed to it? And you may be surprised there are some statements in the scripture that oppose Sinanta, like uh, Krishna telling Nanda Maharaj, just worship work in the Govardhan past. And so that having that there really helps us to understand what are we doing with this, this statement, and yes. Um, this, the course is taught by the Shastric Advisory Council, not just by me, by a lot of our members. It is an eight session, uh, two hour per set, one and a half to two hour per session, eight sessions. Um, it does require some reading and preparation. And uh, so far we've taught it twice. Oh, we taught it to uh, ISKCON leaders, many of whom were in New York and New Jersey. And we also taught it to, uh, through the Vrindavan Institute of Higher Education. And uh, we, we are certainly very, the GBC is very eager for us to teach it again. And then the idea is that the people who study it, they can go on and, and teach it to others. Yes. Anything else anybody would like to bring up? By the way, those materials are publicly available. So <clears throat> anybody can get the materials. I can, uh, I can give them to somebody to give to everybody. Anybody else? The, do the document is profound. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, and um, it helps to process uh, a statement from scripture. Uh, we don't want to bury Shul Prabhupada's statement. He, he um, in the context, he says, this is a woman's nature. That's what it says, Shul Prabhupada says in the purport. Yes. This, he said, this is a woman's nature. And he, if the context is, 
if you think you're a woman, if you say I'm a woman, if you're under the impression that I am this body, then there will be a tendency to act in certain ways, to be unnecessarily offended by a slight offense, to respond in a, you know, over responsive way. If, if you think you're a woman, when, when uh, Mother Vishakha was with Shiva Prabhupada on a morning walk and there was some samyasis there and one samyasi said, Prabhupada is a true woman or nine times more lusty. Prabhupada said, yes. And then Mother Vishak was like, mm. and then somebody else said, Prabhupada, is it true that women are less intelligent? And Prabhupada said, yes. And then Mother Vishak was like cringing and she told me, then she will probably looked at me and said, aren't you glad you're not a woman? And oh, she was like, right, right, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's the problem. In the context of thinking I'm the body, who can deny that there's a tendency to act in a certain way according to that misidentification. But you pointed out very clearly, trust Krishna, turn to Krishna. This is the real solution, you know, and um, we can relax and understand that there really is no problem. Krishna knows what he's doing. Anyway, I'm not sure if that helps or not, but just- It, it does, it does. And I, I, didn't, I didn't focus on the overreacting to slight offenses. Um, but definitely women have a reputation for that, for reacting emotionally. People who think they're a woman. People who think- Have a tendency to be a woman. People who think I'm a woman. But yes. if you hold it, stop the music, hold it right there. That's the problem. I identify thinking I'm a man. That's the problem. I identify thinking I'm this body. And then so many other things come as a concomitant. Now that could have been another. That could be another class on this verse, actually. I mean, body, yeah, that's a good thing. Another class on this verse would be overreacting to slight offenses. Would be identifying with the body. And another one would be identifying with the body. So I could see two other directions. I mean, with every verse, I'm convinced that there's at least two to three hundred different classes that one. And so I think one would be, if you identify with this body, uh -huh. you're also going to be subject to the particular natures of this body. Right. And therefore, you're going to be in trouble. Right. You know, right. like, right. like the male nature is going to be ever more of a tendency towards violence. It just, that's just testosterone. You know? So if you're going to identify as a man, you're going to have that kind of a problem. And also this tendency to overreact to slight offenses. And overreacting to slight offenses are, is particularly a symptom of Tamagun and Rajagun. And so the more that we're affected by Tamagun and Rajagun, the more we're going to overreact to slight offenses, to slight difficulties. So we could, we could give a whole class about the Trinata Peevers. And you know, instead of identifying with Tamagun and Rajagun and overreacting to slight offenses, we could become humble and respect others and not ask any respect for ourselves. And really, again, be on the platform, I'm a soul. How can anybody offend me? I'm a soul. Mm. You know, I already have everything that I need. Why do I have to have a hissy fit and, and leave? <laughs> Who offended me? I'm out of here. <laughs> you know? Why do we have to act like that? Okay. Very good point. Yeah. The soul is not burned by the fire, withered by the wind, moistened by the rain, cut by the sword. And interestingly enough, Shula Prabhupada says, we are all feminine in the sense that we are meant to give pleasure to Krishna. Well, and that's, know, the, that's the real feminine nature. He is there, Purusha. There's only one Purusha. There is a, and this could be yet another class on this verse. There is a sweet, amazing spiritual side of this feminine that you'll notice in Krishna's pastimes I mean most of the violence is done by Krishna not by the ladies like the kill the demon killing and stuff is done by Krishna and the mock fighting and mock wrestling is the cowherd boys not the gopis um, but as far as getting miffed by slight offenses that's mostly the ladies so we don't find often Krishna getting angry by slight offenses. I mean, your book Goswami only gives two examples, 
where Krishna said to a gopi, you were late, you were late for our rendezvous, you spent too much time picking flowers. And another one where he said, why were you late for our rendezvous, you know, in general. But so many examples of the gopis getting angry with Krishna over nothing, over anything or over nothing, and being, I'm not going to see you again. <laughs> you know, so that that tendency of the female to become offended easily and say, I have nothing more to do with you, exists in a sweet form among the gopis and among the queens of Dwarka, where, you know, I'm just studying this in Nectar Devotion, and I'm, I'm teaching right now with the VIHE, the Southern side of the Nectar Devotion, which is chapters 20 through 34. Um, and you have this, I mean, it, it's, it, it's so petty. You know, Satyabhama is saying, ha, huh, Narada Muni was, was glorifying Rukmini in front of me. So I can't even be happy looking at the flowers on the mountain anymore. I mean, what joy is there for me in the world if Narada is going to glorify Rukmini? And this is, that's exactly what they're like. These interactions are based on love, not, yes. on, love, not on selfishness. Exactly. I, I, have to go, I have to go right now, Krishna. I'll go to Suprabhupada. Jai, yes, we should all go. It's after eight. Chila Prabhupada ki jai. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Okay, Mataji, thank you very much. We love you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.